A word. A word. Spread the word. Three of the word and the jip I've had, you know. Every morning when I go in, after first thing I have to do is deal with all my hate mail. Mind you, I usually get most of it written by lunchtime. As usual on the word, our Amanda will be popping up somewhere in America later to say hello. Thank God for speech therapy. Uh, Amanda, where are you this week? Well, I'm just leaving the Universal Amphitheatre in LA, where last night was the annual MTV award ceremony, and it's the show that's beginning to rival the Oscars. Everybody was here Madonna, Sinead O'Connor, Billy Idol, my favourite, Motley Crue, they've all been here, and there were surprise reunions from the Partridge family, new edition with Bobby Brown, I and mean, it's all been happening, you know. And basically, I'm really, really tired because we've been up all night putting together this special little report for you, which you can see later on in the show. Thanks a lot, Amanda. And also tonight, laid-back Hollywood superstar and sex symbol Nicolas Cage gives us a benefit of his life experience. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we see what the Americans thought the Inspiral Carpets when they went to Los Angeles. They can't really relate to the clothes that we're wearing and they can't relate to our influences and stuff like that. And you'll be able to see what happened when Amanda met rock star Billy Idol. Living proof that old punks never die, the trousers just get tighter. Well, for me, it's really exciting. It's, rock and roll's taken me on holiday, isn't it? You know, it's, it's fantastic. They, I always think that it's rather like the purr of a motorbike or the greatest sex. A word. And live music in the studio from Movement 98 featuring Carol Thompson. But first, a man whose experience on the streets of New York led him to be dubbed the best rapper of all time. When he was only 16, he cut the very first track on Rick Rubin's Def Jam label. And now, at the grand old age of 22, is seen as a true hip-hop veteran, LL Cool J. Hey, nice one. Welcome to the show. What's going on? Right, uh, it was the MTV Awards last night, and they've just created a new category for rap. What, why do you think that is? Was well, definitely, you know, some live music. It's going to be a long time. I guess they're finally recognizing it, which is cool. The audience always knew, you know. Well, what do you actually think of the MTV Awards? It's cool. You know, I mean, I'd rather be seen on MTV, period, or something. But, you know, awards are cool. Nothing wrong with the awards. That's good. Have it's you, definitely you... good. It's definitely good, because MTV is a big part of everybody's music now, you know what I mean? Just video in general, all video shows is a big part of music. Has rap become accepted into the mainstream now? I would say so, you know, but it's still cult music. I guess when you, you know, when you go mainstream, I don't like to call it rap. I mean, why, you, you know, it's all different kinds, you know, it's all kind of different kinds of music that's being rapped too, you know what I mean? But yeah, it's being accepted in certain areas. Now, you've sold seven million copies of your album. Are you surprised when you see people like MC Hammer and that getting a lot of accolades nowadays as if you never existed in a way? No, that's like saying, um, you know, is, is Michael mad because Bobby Brown did good? Nah, that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. He's doing fine. Congratulations. Now, uh, the, at the moment, you've got, uh, you know, two live crew involved in this big court case and everything in America. Well, what, which, whose side are you on about that, you know, about kind as of... As far as two live crew is concerned? You want yeah. me to be honest? Yeah. Honestly, I don't yeah. care. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't care. You know what I mean? I really don't care. You know what I'm saying? But it's, um... I mean, you reap what you sow. They knew what they was rapping about, you know. And now they're getting criticized for it, but they're getting paid for it. It's all a game, you know. You, you actually you know, got, got accused of uh, lewdness on stage, didn't you, when you played in Georgia a few years ago? How did that happen? Well, I mean, you know, I, grind, I was grinding on stage. The mayor must have needed bail money or something, you know. I was grinding on stage and they just, you know, snatched me up. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Uh, are you still popular with the women? I, I'm not thinking, you know, it's not like that. I just make music. It's not a, about women or men. I make my music for everybody. 
Uh, have you actually heard uh, any of the new British rap artists at all, and hip hop artists? Well, I know about my man Toons. You know what I'm saying? Not too many though. You know, I've heard I know names, but I don't want to call no names, and they're passe now, and I'm naming the wrong names. Well, what do you, you know? actually think of it? It's cool. Okay. <laughs> it's cool. Do you think, do you think uh, rap white boys can rap too? Rap is for everybody. You don't have. You don't. White or black don't matter. Man. Okay. Well, well uh, one white boy who can certainly rap is Nicky Lockett. Age 20, comes from Moss Side in Manchester. He's performing, known as MC Tunes to the nation, he's performing live on TV. His follow-up single to The Only Rhyme That Bites, along with 808 State, who did our theme music. This is MC Tunes and his brand new single, Versus 808 State, and Tunes Splits the Atom. Of your mind that you will possess. Yeah. Your only gamble before yeah. is a function. The hunger to dance, I cause you a combustion. I make you bang, I make you whistling, Manchester. The dance capital of England. The way I swing is close to us. And at least vocal dominate you like any big on space. The lyrical, miracle, poet, any cool channel. The rap is bigger than the track can't splatter. You feel like the side of my lyrical feast. You stand on the force, but tempo with the heart beat. I'll take root like weed, it's my soil. Rough like a pie, like a phone is my all of oil. Hands on each other, vocal goes to take a force. Four steps to break as I collect my applause. State there, tune splits the atom. Uh, <laughs> just part yourself. <laughs> what, what would your Good home, what, what would your homeboys back in uh, Queens think of MC tunes? Good rock, Good rock. Good stuff. Well, it's it's it. like, You've actually seen our old cool jam in concert yeah, a few times. Back in back in Manchester about a couple of years back, at the Apollo, he was appearing with um, Rakim and uh, Public Enemy. You know, he was the the bad album he was promoting. Mm -hmm. Really good jam. You know, came out the ceiling in a. Radio. <laughs> yep. It's good, you know. A lot of people were there, a lot of people rated it. Mm. Is he one of your heroes then? Well, you know, well respected as an artist. Well respected as an artist. I mean, I was rapping at 14, you know. The first rapper that I acknowledged was LL Cool J, along with Run DMC, you know. I can relate better 
to allow Cool J's music because um, it's more aggressive, you know, more to the point, more forward. There's no fabrication about it, you know, you say what you think, you know, and I can relate to that in a big way, you know. Well, good stuff. Well, uh, both stick around. Unfortunately, you're from New York, not from Manchester, but uh, it's not just Britain, apparently, which has caught Manchester fever. Nearly every magazine in the States has carried articles recently about the music scene in Manchester. We went to Los Angeles to see what happened when the Inspiral Carpets and the Hacienda Club went to California to act as honorary ambassadors for the Ravers Republic at the end of the M62. One hundred six point seven K Rock. It's K R Q F M Pasadena, Los Angeles. World famous K Rock. That's Happy Mondays. And step on. And right now we are going to step on it by saying, like, "Hey, this is it. Manchester vibe in the area at K Rock, Los Angeles. This is uh, the radio station in California that's playing all the best of British music." The kids feel that the English bands offer more. They feel that they're more street, you know, like the Beatles coming from the streets of Liverpool back in the 60s. They feel Morrissey's come from the streets of Manchester and Depeche Mode just come from Basildon, etc. They're not from the glitzy, you know, glamorous suburbs like the Beverly Hills or the Calabasas, and they don't drive Mercedes, you know, they're a little mini. And from the streets of Manchester onto the streets of Los Angeles, the Inspiral Carpets, ready to top the bill at the Roxy Club. <laughs> How's this American tour been going? How have they reacted to you? Uh, dead well, dead well. They've gone mad. Uh, they love it. And we're making lots of money. And we're coming back in October for four weeks. It's just been really good. I mean, like, some of the gigs have been like kind of Manchester reaction, you know what I mean? Pretty mad. Some of the gigs have been full of hillbillies and that, <laughs> you know, but in general it's been smart. What do they know about Manchester, the Americans? Uh, they know it's in England, that's about it. Well, they think they know what's happening musically, but I mean, you know, you can't tell unless you live there, can you, what's happening? I mean, they've heard of four bands from Manchester and that's it. But um, there is a bit of a buzz for it. You know, they, they think it's happening. People seem to be checking out a thing and it, it, a lot of the time, it doesn't seem like a Manchester thing. It's just like this thing in spiral carpets, what they're checking out. <laughs> in downtown Los Angeles, a nightclub is taken over by another Manchester institution, the Hacienda. This is the ID trail. This is the sort of thing you have to do to get into a club nowadays in America, because unlike Manchester, where they're all groovy between the ages of 18 and 22, you've got to be over 21. So it'd be interesting to see what this Hacienda night inside the Mayan Club in Los Angeles is like. <laughs> publicity that the club has received over the last year, both in England and in the international press. It's like a, an internationally known club, um, and DJs around the world respect Mike and Graham and the other DJs at the Hacienda, and they want to come and hear them DJ, and they want to play at their clubs. Is, do you play different music to what you play in the Hacienda on a Friday night? No, well, no, because it wouldn't be much point in me coming, really. Um, I, because I'm billed as like Graham Park from the Hacienda, uh, I just take a box of stuff that I would normally play. So like last week when I was getting my records ready to come over here, I just took the same box that I would be taking to the Hacienda if I was doing it tonight. But because it's in America, I take a second box of stuff that's not so current, maybe from the past three or four months, that maybe is just breaking here or maybe never happened over here. Yes, absolutely. What did you hear about it? But it's 
excellent. It's an excellent, excellent place to go. Well, what do you think the difference is between the crowd that comes to a Hacienda night in Los Angeles to the kind of crowd that goes to the Hacienda in Manchester? Well, yeah, and the one in Manchester, they're cool. And the one here, they're mostly nerds. <laughs> Hey, charming, cool in Manchester, nerds in Los Angeles. What do you reckon of that? Oh, well, cool, cool, Jay. That's cool with me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> have you, have you, you've actually been to Manchester a few times. Have you ever hung out any of the clubs there? No, I haven't. No, I can't lie and say I have. My man could take me around, though. Yeah, definitely. Where, where were you I've taking, seen, then? Well, there's, you know, there's a few places, you know. There's a, I, I, I like the kind of clubs you have to get downstairs into, you know. Just sit back, chill out, listen to some good pumping tune. What, and... You mean illegal ones? Well, not necessarily, you know, but, uh, you know, whatever it, whatever happens, isn't it? You know? OK. But we don't just go to exotic places like LA looking for talent. Our less miserable landed in Bolton recently, where he found two people discussing the latest fashion trends. Is miserable says... Nat and Paul from Bolton make me laugh. We're the poor ports and we are from Manchester. Manchester. And we're not going to do some Manchester poetry. Manchester. This is about him. It's called My Friend Comes from Manchester. Kex too tight. He flirts them. <laughs> Tie dye t shirts. He wears them. Candy flip. Wow. Really sound. Spike Island nearly drowned. He's our local acid tester. Because my friend comes from Manchester. My friend comes from. Manchester police men make him nervous weekends community service wants a fringe going bald sword one on his hat so he don't get called stalks Piccadilly for southerners to pester cause my friend comes from Manchester Tony Wilson can't stand him, the Hacienda has banned him, big beer belly, he still pauses, plays in a band, the 14 stone roses. You may think you're the best, but he's much bester, cause my friend comes from, yeah, my friend comes from, yeah, my friend comes from, Milton Keynes? Hey, sad. Well, that's what Bolton's about, isn't it? You know, 200 years away, I should never marry a cousin. We'll be back after the break with Billy Idol, but first... Which top-rated TV show have all these stars appeared in? Joanne Wally Kilmer, Ben Kingsley, Martin Shaw, Joanna Lumley. Find out after the break. Word. We asked you which TV show have all these stars appeared in. The answer is Coronation Street. <laughs> no escaping from it, is there, this week? Uh, welcome back. In this part, Billy Idol with Mr. Puncher Punk. But first, something almost as sleazy as Billy. The latest scandals and juice which we've unearthed on another mission. This tape right. contains star-sensitive stories for operational use only. Classified this week are The Cure, The Turtles, and Paula Abdul. The Gulf Crisis already has Hollywood rushing to cash in. Rob Lowe War Movie Team Six has been revamped and retitled Desert Shield. Further Yankee propaganda comes from Hank Williams Jr., who gives Saddam baiting a country twang. Yeah, I'd like to find out just for fun just how fast those camels can run. I... London had a new pirate radio station for two hours last week. Aging punks The Cure have turned radio pirates to blast the airwaves with their latest album as a publicity gimmick. Frontman Robert Smith manned the high-tech console but seemed blinded by science. Give this man a guitar. The wait we were... Luther Vandross, circa 1990. Luther Vandross, circa 1985. And these are the boys. A 90s answer to the Jackson 5. Brothers aged 9 to 15. Their first album went platinum. Their 
that new one has a more mature sound. A little older, a little more mature. And um, we just did what we felt. The boys also direct their own videos. Already the juvenile jokers are sending up their megastar mentors. Like Michael Jackson. And Madonna. The hype continues. The turtles are out of the sewer and have signed a recording deal with a fast food chain. Over here, Pizza Dude! We'll share them with our friends here a little later. Their new album, Coming Out of Their Shells, is coming out in the States. It's only available from Pizza Takeaways. The Sheen family. The good guys. Dad Martin hands out food to the hungry. And sons, Charlie Sheen and Emilio Estevez, make an environmentally conscious movie, Men at Work. I'm not one of those actors who gets out there and, and, and who shows up at rallies and I don't carry signs. And if I can do it in my work, then I'm reaching a much broader and, and bigger audience. Like father, like sons. This is Paula Abdul today. This is Paula Abdul, circa 1977. It's from a low-budget movie, Junior High School, which she thought was dead and buried. Note the seeds of her singing and dancing career. self-destruct. Well, forget Paula Abdul as a dancer, because every week if you've been watching The Word, you'll have noticed our dancers. The best on TV since that programme, Soul Train, or as I used to like to call it, Hey, Look At Me, I'm on Telly Train, finished. Anyway, Joey auditioned as one of the Word dancers, uh, but we let you dance anyway, didn't we? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, we auditioned on a Sunday. Uh, my agency, the company, phoned us up, um, asked us to come, to come down. I wasn't too pleased. On a, it was on a Sunday, though. <laughs> Had to get up especially early Are you a professional it. dancer, then? No, um, no, I'm just a club dancer. So how many nights do you go out to the club? <laughs> it depends how I feel. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's five times a week. Five times a week? Yeah, and I get up to go to work as well. <laughs> do you have to go to keep fit classes? Do I need it? Do you think I need it? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'll come and feel your, 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 your equivalent of the petrols in a bit. I think I do enough dancing. I make up for the dancing. Okay, thanks a lot, Joe. And if you'd like to be a word dancer, just write to the word PO Box 972, London E14 9TG. And write to the same address for our house party competition. And if you do an act, you, might, you think might interest Les Miserable. And don't forget to include your phone number. Now, when he was a kid, William Broad knocked around in his Timpson specials, dreaming of stardom. Realising if he wanted to be a rock god, he couldn't be called William, he changed his name to something really rebellious. Billy. Well, Billy Idol, to be precise. In 1981, after Generation X split up, Billy emigrated to America, where he's become a massive star, thanks to the fact that his music and image haven't changed for over ten years. Over here, though, our Bill is more famous for his recent bike smash than his music. Amanda de Cadenet asked him what happened. It was rush hour, so I was wending my way through the traffic when out of the blue, a car came out of the blue and hit me and um, caught me, broadsided me right into my leg and made the bone explode through, through the muscle and the tissue, ripping it away. What did they do? Did they kind of put it all back together? And... Yeah, then they, what they do is they put, uh, they screw two, uh, what they do is they screw two, I'll show you what it looks like. Look, God, Let's have a look. look. It's really horrible. Ooh. Yeah, I had five operations. Oh, God. So it's all pretty horrible. Were you really I don't worried? recommend it to anybody. So all these stories <laughs> that I liked the idea of having a motorcycle accident, that I that I dreamt of it is a load of crap. I mean, um, I believe when you go on a motorbike, you always want to get to the other end unhurt. You know, and that that's why I really. Yeah, I ride so because people I keep saying to me, "Oh, you you you've got a death, death wish. wish. You'd love to die on it," and that's just a load of rubbish. I'm not that sort. I'm not an idiot. Riding how did you get started? 
Uh, well, I was in a punk rock group called Generation X when I was 19. And I was on top of the pops when I was 19. I got the money, well, that's okay. Because I live from day to day. Going around the country having as much sex with as many people as possible at 19. And how long did you keep I was being doing thrown it? out of clubs and record companies and at 19. It was great. Good fun. Yeah, it's really great fun. And you stopped doing that now, of course. No, I'm st oh, still, no, still doing I'm it. still 19. Still 19. So what, what happened to Generation X then? Uh, well, I think what, I, what happens to most bands, but what should happen to all punk rock groups is they should disintegrate. <laughs> We'd done what we set out to do, and it was it was just as well to to knock it on the head. And, uh, and I made my escape to America. <laughs> Involved in being the wild man of rock. You don't want to find out, do you? Yeah, I do. Tell me. I'm interested. Right. Turn that camera off. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll never show this flaming interview. Yeah, they will. Well, I think, uh, I think really, you just have to enjoy yourself, and I think then people will call you the wild man of rock. <laughs> And invent all these wonderful stories that actually are true. So. And that's the best thing about it, because you can do it. Oh, I think, yeah, that's what rock and roll is all about, you know. Having a great time, really, and then, in, then sort of along the way you get all these songwriting experiences. So you think you can just keep on sort of being involved in rock and roll forever, really? It's an ongoing thing. I think you're getting a bit on for it. Well, I'm only 34, darling. Well, that's not too old, is it? I don't think so, do you? Well, someone of my age is... My age, we're It's thinking. just about the right age, isn't it? <laughs> I sold a <the> man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you've had this image, though, for, for, like, a long time now. Have you not wanted to change it till you've had your hair, do you? And no, I like the way I look. I think uh, I'm not sort of a... I'm not a fashion plate. I'm not a clothes horse. I'm Billy Idol. Why would I want to change what I am, you know? kind of good fun. I don't, I'm not doing it just to have an image or something. I'm doing it for because I like it, you know. I don't really care what the people like or don't like, you know. That's their game. <laughs> and would you believe our Billy actually won an MTV award just ten hours ago for Cradle of Love as best video in a film. More of that later, but despite his nasty injury which you saw there, Billy is still a frisky chap and quite fancy the idea of Amanda examining his pistons and enticing her away from her boyfriend, Duran Duran's John Taylor. Well, Billy might be a rock and roller on the inside, but take my word for the outside is a real smoothie. I think punk rock was successful in what it set out to do, which is really to excite everybody about music again and sort of to pave a way for bands like Duran Duran and other people like that who uh, <laughs> believe you're seeing right now. And I was just yeah, wondering how, right. how the hell I could get in there. But... <laughs> Well, I think it's kind of exciting now. I've been able to live in London, New York, and Los Angeles, and now I'm just looking for the next place. What about your house? <laughs> well, um, I'll have to check it out with John first, but by all means, I mean, you know. Oh, yeah, I forgot about it. Yeah. yeah. I like it in the hills. I like in it. Hills. In your hills. <laughs> <laughs> you can see I've got a big scar on my arm. Oh, that's a big one. Really? That is a big one. <laughs> uh, the scar is pretty big as well, anyway. Uh... <laughs> nice one, eh? You can tell, even though he's had his accident, the only thing that's limp is his leg, innit? <laughs> and uh, in today's sum, there's a letter from Billy Idol's dad saying, What a nice bloke he really is. Uh, hello, Kill Jay, you saw his chalk technique there with the mandra. Is that quite? Is that the kind of smooth talk you'd use on a woman in Queens in New York? This guy's so funny, man. I don't even know what to say no more on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, yo. <laughs> I mean, you got Billy over here trying to take the broad and all that. I don't know, man. I'm just cooling, man. <laughs> does this not go on on American TV? Huh? This kind of thing does Oh, we get on. real busy over there. <laughs> we get real busy, man. Real busy. Were well, you a Billy Idol, a secret Billy Idol fan in your you gotta youth? You got to be joking, man. <laughs> Billy Idol is, you know, 
<laughs> anyway, it's uh, just gone half past six, or if you're watching the repeat, <laughs> half past one. And still to come, we've got Nicolas Cage at the Star Studded MTV Awards, where you can see, amongst others, Madonna, MC Hammer, Bobby Brown in excess, and even Paula Abdul, and okay. see what Sinead O'Connor said, said about the force oh, the Americans please. made when she refused. <laughs> hey, have you, listen, you find out about this in a minute if you it's stick around. Brick. Plus, uh, live here, we've got Carol Thompson with Movement 98. Uh, time to look at some of the latest film and video releases this week with the aid of this, which uh, you've already spotted. This is a tantrum brick, right? If you get mad at the TV, you throw it at it. <laughs> and, it and it knocks it off for 20 minutes until you calm down. 25 grand, that. And it's staying there. Uh, after all the, after the, all the hype, the biggest British movie of the year, Memphis Belle is released, but it's not the best week for new films, so instead we're concentrating on videos. Former ballet dancer Patrick Swayze uh, is currently number one in the video rental charts with Roadhouse. We're going to have a look at his uh, latest video release now, though, Next of Kin. Patrick Swayze is Detective Truman Gates. He's a country boy. We are gonna find Gerald's killer. But he's got some unfinished business. The family killed his brother. A life for a life. Amen. Amen. But they never counted on his next of kin. You mess with my brother, you mess with me. Settle this now. Anywhere he wants! When these boys head for the city, Someone better head for the hills. We ain't seen bad yet, but it's coming. And you can see Patrick Swayze on the word in a few weeks' time. Uh, have you actually seen that film yet? What's Patrick Swayze one next of kin? Nah. No. No. <laughs> what, what, what kind of movies do you like? Uh, I like Freddy Krueger. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I like to see, you know, I like wild movies, man. Listen, I'll, I'll give you the number for a psychiatrist. <laughs> okay. Hey, you like this one, though. This is uh, The Best of Blue Peter from the 60s and 70s. You got your wife on video? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait till you see this. This is well kinky. Now available for sale on video. Uh, your wife. <laughs> Hey, cringeworthy. Did you ever enter any of the uh, Blue Peter competitions tunes? You've got to be joking. <laughs> well, you never wanted a badge? Blue Peter was a put show, but <laughs> always has been, you know? I mean, I used to watch, you know, good programmes. What? Like, hey. Blue Peter out learning how to build a television set out of an egg box is not my idea. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to stick about plastic, though. And uh, while you recover from that dose of Blue Peter, here's a little poser for you. Who was this song written about? Was it Oliver Reed? Warren Beatty or Mick Jagger. Find out after the break. The Word. The Word. We asked you who was the song written about. The answer is Warren Beatty. Hollywood actor Nicolas Cage had to put up with charges of nepotism when his uncle Francis Ford Coppola gave him his first starring role in Rumblefish. Highly praised performances, though, in films like Raising Arizona, Moonstruck, and Now Wild at Heart have since established Nicolas Cage as one of Hollywood's brightest stars. He dropped into the word earlier for a little chat. This wood is fake. I don't care! I ain't no freaking monument to justice! I lost my hand! I lost my bride! Johnny has his hand! Johnny has his bride! You want me to take my heartbreak, put it away, and forget? Lula. Hey. Peanut! Hey, baby! Oh, wow. Baby, I got a surprise for you. What? Hey, my snakeskin jacket! Thanks, baby! 
Did I ever tell you that this here jacket represents a symbol of my individuality and my belief in personal freedom? About 50,000 times. I got us a room at the Cape Fear. And guess what? Power Man's playing at the Hurricane. hurricane. Stabbing him steer. Ain't getting typecasting a lot of unhinged roles. <laughs> Well, you know, I just happen to be unhinged myself, so it just sort of falls into place naturally. I can't help it, but I dig your uh, your studio here, the word. It's kind of cool. The uh, the coloration is wild. Some of the sex scenes are wild at heart. Were quite raunchy, weren't they? Uh, the sex scenes are kind of wild, but but I think that actually the sex is uh, it's very sweet. It's very pure. It's. Uh, it's uh, it's not an exploitive kind of sexuality. I think it's a celebration of sexuality. It's kind of like saying that if you're really in love, it's cool to have radical sex. Do you actually learn anything that you can use in real life from your choreography of those kind of scenes? Um, well, we we talked about various favorite <laughs> positions, and David said what his favorite position was, and I said what mine was, and Laura said what hers was. So we all got our favorite positions in there, and. Uh, yeah, sometimes you borrow from it. Life imitates art, and art imitates life. I saw I saw that, you know, in life might be more enjoyable, not as visually good on uh, the screen. Well, you tend to ham it up a little on the screen. You try to make it look like you're really good at it. Um, <laughs> ha, 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 anyway. Uh, but uh, it's enjoyable in life. Yeah, come on. Sex is where it's at. Mm, I mean, you were quite a smoldering type of character in uh, Moonstruck, weren't you? Did, did that actually, you know, increase your... Sexual appetite or turnover, my... Turnover, I was going to say. My turnover? Um, well, uh, well uh, possibly so, you know. Uh, girls like guys with wooden hands, and in Moonstruck I had a wooden hand, and that just, you know, really turned them on. They, uh, they dig it for some reason. You should try it. Get yourself a wooden hand. Go out there, uh, like Piccadilly Square or whatever. Check it out. You will not fail. It's the best line, one line, you'll, you'll get it. You, you actually spent some time in a correction centre, didn't you? Correctional facility? Is that what <laughs> no, man, I'm a good guy. I didn't hurt anybody. I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you why I went to this school, if you want to know that. It was lunchtime. Right, and uh, and every all the students were supposed to bring lunch for all the other kids, you know, and uh, prepare something. So I said, I'll bring egg salad sandwiches. And uh, well, I went home <clears throat> and I went to this this store and I bought five cans of fried grasshoppers. Right, check it out. And uh, <laughs> I put the fried grasshoppers in the egg salad sandwiches, you know, and I mixed it up and I made these sandwiches. Then I went to school, and I said, let's have a picnic, you know, and everyone brought their, you know, whatever, Coke, Diet Up, 7-Up, and they started eating these f fried grasshopper sandwiches, and then they, they noticed that there was an antenna in there, and they said, oh, there's a leg in there. They blew the whistle on me, man. I was, I was, I was air freighted out of that school so fast. You would, you know, it was just crazy. Have you, ever, have you ever held any little parties at, at your, your pad in Hollywood and, like, invited a few people <laughs> out for sandwiches? You mean, have I had any bug bashes? <laughs> yeah, I have bug bashes all the time. <laughs> Man, you want to go to one? <laughs> Come on, you're invited. Everybody is. You actually ate an insect yourself, didn't you, in one of your films? I, I, I ate, yes, I ate a bug, yeah. What was that like? It was awful. You see, I like bugs uh, to look at, but I don't like cockroaches to look at, and I don't uh, like eating them. And, <clears throat> well, they wanted me, me to eat raw eggs. And I said, well, that's boring. That's been done before, right? So I want to eat a giant cockroach. So they had these cockroach wranglers in New York City wrangle up these bugs that were about that big. And I walked on the set, and I saw the antennas going, the legs kicking. And uh, I almost couldn't do it because every muscle in my body was telling me not to do it. So, uh, But I went ahead and did it, and I couldn't sleep for three days, and I couldn't eat for two days, and uh, it was a nightmare. Why not? I just, it, it, just, it, it just was, you just don't eat cockroaches. You're just not supposed to do that, right? And I ate it, and I just, it really screwed me up. 
Mm. I mean, did, did, did Cher mind, do, you know, doing love scenes with you where you have to kiss her? Well, Knowing see, that you'd eaten a cockroach. She didn't know about it yet because I made that movie after I made Moonstruck. But I'll tell you what, I wish I had done it the other way before, you know, Moonstruck, so that I could kiss her knowing that I ate a cockroach and knowing that she would have to deal with it. You know, it's just kind of a funny thought. Is, is that something that you have to tell women when you're going out with them? You know, you say, hey, look, I've got a confession to make. I've actually eaten, <laughs> eaten <laughs> Um, no, they, they, sometimes they already know about it, and, uh, it's the weirdest thing, it's like the wooden hand. For some reason, if they know you ate a cockroach, it just turns them on. I can't, I don't know what it is, I can't explain it, but if you, today, go eat a cockroach, and you go somewhere, go out to a nightclub and say, hey, baby, I just ate a cockroach, I guarantee you, you heard it from me, you're gonna, wow, it's just gonna happen like that. That, thanks yeah. for coming in. What are you going to be doing this weekend in London then? Go off to Lo uh, Loch Ness and check out if I can find that monster. Because I'm going to hang out in Scotland until I find it. Now, I hear it's been quiet for eight years, but I'll be there for ten if it takes ten to see it. So I, uh, that's where I'll be if you want to get a hold of me. Loch Ness. Wow. Hey, I'm sure he was second to Mickey there, don't you? <laughs> Hey, you need to get a big sandwich to fit the Loch Ness Monster on. Have you ever eaten any uh, unsavory no, insects? No, I don't, mess, I don't mess around, man. I don't mess around. Stay well, you, away from the bugs bashes. No. Hey, never mind. No. Last night, the uh, cream of the pop wheel, the grovel. Right there, Mmm! <laughs> 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 Frog dog! We're going to have a look at the MTV Awards. Because uh, the MTV Awards took place last night in LA and uh, they were handing out all the annual awards for music videos. Our Amanda was there as the stars rolled up. Clock LA time, and behind me, the Universal Amphitheatre is packed with 2,000 people from the world of showbiz. Basically, anybody that could get a ticket. Earlier, emerging from a constant stream of limos were some of Pop's biggest stars, all anxiously wondering whether they're going to pick up one of the 21 awards here tonight, especially to put on their mantelpiece. <laughs> The awards are chosen by the industry especially to recognise the importance of videos in selling music. So the ceremony itself is energised by...